chapter eight, articulations and movements. So what we refer to as joints are joints, shoulder joint, knee joint, elbow joint. Their, um, their technical name is articulations. They're articulations um, between two bones. Some of these permit movement, others do not. For example, <clears throat> the sutures in our skull or cranial bones permit zero movement for obvious reasons. Your brain's in there. You don't want it moving around. But uh, other joints like your knee and your shoulder uh, are freely movable. And uh, there's a spectrum on which they move on. Um, so joints are classified functionally by the amount of movement they allow. That is, they can go from completely immovable to slightly movable to freely movable uh, with a range of freely movable joints. For example, your elbow is freely movable, but it's only freely movable in one plane, meaning you can flex and extend your elbow, whereas your shoulder is freely movable in three planes. So you can <clears throat> take it into the forward plane, sagittal plane, transverse plane, so it's it triaxial is what that would be called. So joints are classified based on function, which is their range of motion and the amount of movement they allow, and also the structure, um, which is more the makeup of the joint. What does it look like? Does it look like a hinge? Does it look like a ball and socket? Um, that type of thing. Okay. A couple of things also to remember, right? Tendons connect bone to muscle. Ligaments connect bone to bone. You strain a tendon and you sprain a ligament. All right, so uh, joints are both or arthroses are connections between bones. And as we've established, they there's a range of motion um, or functionality amongst them. And the first one is synarthritic joints or completely immovable. These don't move. Don't permit movement. There's amphiarthritic joints, which are slightly movable. Um, and so carpals, Parcels. There's a little bit of movement, but not like crazy movements, not really going anywhere. And then there's diarthritic joints, which are really movable. And these are really most of the ones we think about. So, you know, everything from fingers to wrist to elbow to shoulder, etc. Right. Um, and that leads us to the strength versus mobility. Now, the more mobile a joint is, the less stable that joint is. And so a highly mobile joint does not tend to be very stable. For example, shoulders. Shoulders are incredibly mobile, but very unstable. So huge mobility, but decreased stability. Whereas, you know, the joints between our vertebra are not just one joint from one vertebra to another is not very mobile, but it's very stable. That's why you have so many vertebra because you have to have a lot of little joints doing a little bit of movement in order to produce a big movement in your trunk. Um, so the least strong are going to be the diarthritic joints or freely movable. And the synarthritic are going to be the most stable, right? Because they, well, I should say, least mobile, least movement. Um, and but they're very stable. Uh, and so they're the least chance of injuries. So this is an example here of a suture and it's a synarthritic joint. 
and it's completely immovable, super stable. This on the other hand, freely movable, less stable. And so when you go through these um, classifications, uh, it will tell you, you know, what type is it? So bony fusions, fibrous joints, cartilaginous joints, and synovial joints. And when you look at bony fusions, that's where, you know, bones fuse together and they're synarthritic, right? No movement. Fibrous joints would be like sutures or between uh, the teeth and the jaw. That's a gomphosis. Uh, and semi uh, desmosis it would be uh, promote, producing a little bit of movement. So that would be amphiarthritic. And um, I'll show you an example of that. Uh, cartilaginous joints would be like a fibrocartilage joint, pubic symphysis. There is a little bit of movement there, um, but not much. Uh, synchondrosis uh, also would be like the uh, long bones and where the hyaline cartilage gets replaced and grows together, what we call your growth plate. And then the synovial joints, those are the most common. These are the freely movable. And um, these are the ones that we talk about. So mono axial means it, it can go in one direction or plane. Biaxial is two planes of movement and triaxial is three planes of movement. And we'll see some examples of that. So synarthritic joints, completely immovable, and it sutures like in your skull right, these sutures, uh, gomphosis between your jaws and your teeth, uh, synchondrosis, um, so here where the epiphyses um, fuse with the metastasis, and synostosis, example of this is where three bones fuse together like in your oscoxis, so you have the ilium, ischium, and the pubic bone. Uh, Ampiarthritic joints, there's a little bit of movement there. Um, we talked about the fibrous ones, like the pubic symphysis, but also um, pointing out the radius, how the radius kind of rolls in place uh, in the radial notch of the ulnar bone. Um, that's an example of uh, ampiarthritic joint. Uh, Diarthritic joints, freely movable, and these are what we call synovial joints. So synovial joints, um, shoulder, elbow, hip, knee, they all have some basic characteristics and that's there's a joint capsule surrounding the joint. There's always articular cartilage between um, the two bones or lining the ends of the bones where they articulate. There's fluid in that capsule and membrane called synovial fluid and then there's always accessory structures. So when we look at these, um, Remember that the periosteum covers the outside of the bone. Right? So we've got the periosteum here and then it stops. And then you have articular cartilage. So this right here is articular cartilage, lining the ends of the bone. And then on the inside of that, you're gonna have a synovial membrane. So this inner membrane is the synovial membrane and then you have an outer fibrous joint capsule. So that joint capsule is gonna be going from one side of the joint to the other. Like that, right? So that would be the fibrous joint capsule. And other things that you're gonna find in synovial joints, um, for example, are gonna be bursa sacs. So you have bursa sacs that are filled with fluid and they also create space. So space for the tendon, between, so you have a kind of a cushion, some space between the tendon and the bone, um, that helps. Uh, you also have, uh, so meniscus are uh, cartilaginous pads for uh, protection uh, and extra support. Um, there's gonna be uh, fluid inside this joint capsule, right? So you'll have fluid in here. So synovial fluid will be inside the joint capsule. So um, the synovial fluid is really important, right? So it's joint capsule containing synovial fluid and it's important for nourishing, right? The chondrocytes or the cells that produce the cartilage. 
um, and also acting as a shock absorber. So to have that liquid in there kind of helps uh, decrease the forces of this bone kind of smashing down on that bone. Uh, accessory structures, again, you can have meniscus in the knee. Uh, you can have ligaments attaching different portions, for example, an intercapsule ligament uh, or the uh, medial and lateral collateral ligaments. Uh, there's always tendons connecting the muscles. So in this case, you have the patellar tendon from the quads up here uh, to the tibial tuberosity. Uh, attaching there. Uh, and uh, then again, like I said, you're going to have bursa sacs in shoulders and knees. These bursa sacs are fluid filled and you can see how they are on both sides of this tendon, giving it space and kind of extra cushion. Uh, now, when these bursa sacs get irritated, they can also swell uh, and get inflamed and we call that bursitis. So classification of joints um, based on movement. So um, there are different types of movements uh, that your body can make, our articulations can make, and linear movement is an example of these ampy um, arthritic joints, right? So slightly movable joints. Slightly movable joints. And so it's like it just slides a little bit linear one way or a little bit linear the other way, but it's not actually going anywhere. So this, this pencil is just meant you put your pencil down and you slide it this way or you slide it that way, but it's just linear. That's different than angular movements. Now, angular movements you're going to see in things like uh, shoulder, elbow, knee, uh, ankle, uh, wrist, and so forth. So that's not a complete list, but you're, these are the joints that we most often use. And there's really two main types of angular movements, and that's abduction and adduction. Okay, so abduction is, abduction is away from body. And adduction is uh, you're adding back to the body. Flexion and extension are talking about joint angles. And we'll get into this in another slide. But basically, the definition of flexion is joint angle gets smaller. And extension is joint angle gets larger. Uh, so that would be angular. Um, when they're showing this uh, here, angular movement is you start with the pencil here. And as you can see, I'm not changing the where my pencil point is. I'm actually just moving my Apple Pencil around in an angular fashion. So if you start in anatomical position, that would be here. And if you go to here, you've changed that angle. If you go to there, you've now changed that angle. And so this is angular. Circumduction is a specific type of angular motion. Um, it's for arms and legs, really. And you're moving in an angle with your arm, but it forms a circle pattern with your arm. So if you're this little stick figure here, and you move your arm, I'll make it in a different color. So your arm goes up, and then down, and then down, and then down, and then up, and then up, you're actually changing the angle. You're not rotating, which is different, right? So this is rotation. This is again where you put your pencil down and I'm literally just spinning in one place. So I'm spinning around. I'm not changing the angle. The pencil is straight up 90 degrees and it stays there. And it's just rotating in one spot. So that's rotational movement. 
um, special type of rotational movement is pronation and sup supination. And that's really, we talk about that with our wrist. Uh, and then there's special movements. Really, these are flexion and extension. Uh, it just depends on the direction. And we'll talk about these. So in looking at this lovely model, uh, this we're going to start with angular movements. So these are all angular movements here. These are all angular. And the first one is abduction, adduction. So you start off abduction is away. And adduction is adding, adding the arm back, right? So adding it back to the body. So abduction is away, abduction is away, and adduction is towards. Flexion and extension. So if you're starting here, right? So this is anatomical position. Anatomical position. And uh, this would be 180 degrees, right? So half a circle is 180. If you're starting here, this would be zero. And this up here would be 180 degrees. And so right about here would be 90. If you start at zero degrees and you go from zero and you bring your arm up to here, now you're at 90 here. And so if you go from 180 to 90, the joint angle just got smaller. And so, uh, that would be the definition of flexion. If you bring it from 90 back to uh, 180, it would be getting bigger, right? So let's do it this way. So 180 all the way around. And so uh, joint angle goes from 180 to 90, that's flexion. And if it goes from 180 or from zero up there back, it's getting larger. That would be extension. Uh, I mentioned that. I don't know if I did a very good job just now, but I'll show you in another way. So again, this is anatomical position. If I were to bend my knee and swing your leg up, and then the knee gets bent like this, and there's the foot. Again, it's going to go from 180 to 90, and that is flexion. So joint angle gets smaller. If I were to then straighten my leg and go back to 180, that would be extension because the joint angle gets bigger. So again, flexion and then extension going back out. In the wrist, you start at anatomical position and your wrist is straight down. If you make this angle smaller, it's flexion. If you bring it back and make it bigger, it's extension. Abduction, adduction, you can also do with your wrist, making your pollux go towards your body or away from your body or your fingers. Uh, and then again, circumduction is, is an angular motion because you are going up and then you're just changing angles with your arm and your shoulder joint is changing angles in order to make a circle. You're not actually spinning in one place. Uh, lateral flexion is where you start off in anatomical position and then you bend to the side. So we go like this. And so you've gone laterally and you flex laterally because again, this angle gets smaller. Rotational movements is just straight rotation, right? So you can rotate your neck 
you can rotate your torso, right, or your back. And you can rotate your shoulder, and you can rotate your hand, and you can rotate your legs. Uh, so rotation is just where you're actually spinning in one direction, right? So if your arm is hanging down by your side, here's my stick person again, and this arm is just spinning around, and spinning back, this angle hasn't changed. It's just rotate that the limb is rotating in place. And so the joint angle itself has not changed. And so you can have external or lateral rotation. That is where uh, your pollux or thumb moves laterally or externally. And then you have internal rotation where your pollux moves medial or internally. Uh, I shouldn't say pollux because it could be pollux or hallux. Right? So you could be moving your leg or toes medial or lateral. Pronation, supination, really for the wrist. Supination is what you are in anatomical position. You can hold soup and palm when you're supinated. Pronation would be this. So this is pronation and this is supination. Not showing you here, pronation. So this is pronation, this is supination. Right, so supination and pronation. Uh, special movements. Um, so with the ankle, uh, your ankle, so this is ankle and this is ankle. So eversion is where you swing your leg out. So when you evert, you bring your foot out. When you invert, you kind of roll your ankle out and bring your foot in. So most ankle sprains are inversion sprains, where you roll your ankle out to the side. With dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, uh, plantar starts with a P, and you are pointing toes. Let's make that a little darker. Point starts with the P and plantar flexion starts with the P. That's where you point, point your toe. Dorsiflexion is where you pull your toes up towards you. So toes up towards you. Point toes. Uh, lateral flexion, again, it can be neck, it can be spine, neck and spine. Uh, retraction protraction is showing you the mandible or the chin, but also this is shoulders, right? So shoulders can retract, right? You pull your shoulder blades back for retraction and then you bring them forward for protraction. Opposition, this is, this is what puts us at the top of the food chain. It's the ability for your thumb, digit one, to touch digit five, digit four, digit three, and digit two. So it can go here, 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 and here. This is opposition. And we're the only species that can actually do this for even apes. Uh, in chimpanzees, their thumb uh, does not go all the way. It's too short. So thumb too short in all other species. So the thumb can't make it all the way to the top of the pinky, digit four, digit three, digit two, 
And what that does is it makes it so you can't, you can't have a pincer grip, right? So when your thumb touches your index finger, you can write with a pencil or you can create something really tiny, microchips, weapons, that kind of thing, but they don't have that ability. So their thumb's too short, so they kind of have to kind of grasp things very crudely <clears throat> and they don't have fine motor skills. So opposition is where you can kind of make a pincer grip. Uh, depression and elevation you can do with your mandible. You can also do this with your shoulders, right? You can elevate and depress your shoulders. All right, so um, that's range of motion. Now we're gonna talk about classification based on structure. So uh, there are gliding joints, like the clavicle and the manubrium. There's pivot joints, that's the atlas and axis. And saddle joints, that's your thumb. Hinge joint, that's elbow, knee. Ellipsoid, that's gonna be the metacarpal um, carpal phalange. And then ball and socket are shoulders and hips. So these are what they look like. We talk mostly, you know, the hinge joint, the elbow, uh, the ball and socket joints of the hip and shoulder. Um, the saddle joint is what allows us to do opposition and the pivot joint allows us to shake our head no. Uh, an interesting thing, hinge joints are generally um, monoaxial, uh, but with the knee, it's a little bit of a biaxial joint that you can do a little rotation. Uh, saddle joints are biaxial, ball and socket joints are triaxial. They're the only ones that can go in three different planes. So this goes through and it's kind of showing you different movements. Um, now a few things on joints, they're named for the two bones that articulate. Uh, I'm not having you memorize these uh, joints or articulations, but you should be able to figure them out. And the, an example is TMJ, it's temporo. So temporal bone and mandible, right? And so temporal mandibular joint, this is here where the mandible articulates with the temporal bone. And so the joints are named for the two bones that articulate. The ligaments are also named for the bones that articulate or the structures, right? So lateral is, is referring to it's on the lateral aspect. Right, so lateral aspect versus stylo-mandibular. So from the styloid process to the mandibular angle. Or sphenomandibular is from the mandible to the pterygoid process of the sphenoid. So these ligaments are just named for attachment sites. Same with uh, the vertebra, um, supraspinous ligaments, interspinous, they're going between the spines. Uh, whether it's in the front, anterior, or posterior. Um, so again, we're not memorizing these, but I do want to go over how they're named. Uh, with the vertebra, there are a, a number of little joints, right? So um, there's a joint or articulation here, a joint or articulation there, one there, all the way down, right? And so each one produces a little bit of movement or allows for a little bit of movement, but throughout the entire spine, you can produce bigger movements. So like anterior flexion. Um, your neck, if you go to look down at your shoes, you're doing anterior flexion. If you bend forward to tie your shoes, you're doing anterior flexion. Uh, that is opposed to lateral flexion, when you just bend laterally to the side. If you go from being bent forward to tie your shoes to coming back straight up, back to anatomical position, now you are extending. If you go past anatomical position, then it is called hyperextension. Okay, so hyperextension is here is from the side, right? So here's our little stick man. So this is anatomical position. And if they were to go back, right? And we do kind of a back bend. They're now, this would be anatomical position and they're past that. So now it's hyperextension. So anytime you go past anatomical position, we call it hyperextension. 
Uh, and you can also rotate or twist at the spine, right? Again, it's important to remember that uh, the way that these, these vertebra are formed are because we have all these processes to have things attach, like ligaments and muscles. There's a lot of little layers of muscles. Uh, and, and those muscles are there connected to the spinous process and the transverse processes to allow for this space called the intervertebral foramen right, because the spinal nerves come out. And we want to preserve this diameter here for those spinal nerves. If there's a lot of compressive forces, the muscles aren't strong, you have all these forces pushing down on these discs, uh, then it's going to push this gel, right, out to the side because it's getting smashed, right? So this is going down. And this is going down. And so there's a lot of forces, no muscles, you're not, you don't have strong muscles. And so it's going to squish this disc. This disc is going to get thinner. And this hole gets smaller. Right? And the gel pushes out and it can hit the spinal nerves. So not only is the diameter getting area, uh, smaller, but um, the diameter of the intervertebral foramen is getting smaller, but you have this gel kind of pushing out and can actually hit the nerve. So that's why a herniated disc will hurt. It will hurt if the nerve is constantly being stimulated. Just to kind of go over the um, shoulder joint, um, you don't have to, again, memorize these things, but realize you have uh, features in the knee. You have meniscus in the um, shoulder. You have a labrum. Uh, in the ball and socket joints uh, in your hip. Uh, and so this is this labrum kind of around the glenoid cavity where there's articular cartilage. Then you will also have lots of ligaments and lots of bursas, right? So bursas are named for location. So subscapular, sub below the coracoid process, below the acromion, so their subacromion, and then ligaments are gonna be named for where they're attached, right? So acromial, uh, coracoacromial ligament would this be this one, coracoacromial ligament. And then you have the coracoclavicular ligament and the coracohumeral ligament and the acromioclavicular ligament. So you have all these ligaments just named for where they're attached. And so this kind of gives you a, a view. Um, again, when someone has biceps tendonitis, so you can see the tendon of the biceps is in this intertrabecular groove right here in this sleeve. And uh, you can start to have irritation of this bicep tendonitis when you have a shoulder impingement or the shoulder gets tight. So when the shoulder gets tight, uh, what happens is the neck muscles are pulling the acromion down and your chest muscles are rolling the head of the humerus kind of in towards your body. And what this does is when you go to lift your arm up, this tendon right here, this tendon right here gets smashed up against the acromion when you lift your arm. And it keeps doing it over and over and over again. And so right here is where it gets irritated and it starts hurting down the tendon or down the front of the arm. It's easier to show you if I had an actual skeleton, but I don't in front of me. Um, so the bursa sacs again are named for location. Ligaments of the hip, again, iliofemoral, right? It's from the iliac to the femur, uh, ischiofemorals from the ischium to the femur. Uh, in the front, uh, the iliofemoral ligament is what is creating this intertrochanteric line. And you have this fibrous cartilage, you have acetab acetabular labrum as well, uh, and um, the hip joint, as you can see, is also a synovial joint. So a partial hip replacement is just where they would replace the 
ball, the ball and socket, and a full hip replacement, you're replacing the socket and the ball. So you guys can look those up on YouTube if you're actually interested. Um, okay, one thing I do want you to know uh, are the supporting ligaments in the knee and supporting structures of the knee, because it's really important a lot of people injure their knees. Um, and so you have the quadricep tendon, which is the patella tendon. And then you have the sesamoid bone, the patella inside the patellar tendon, and then it becomes a patellar ligament because it's bone to bone, right? So we call it this. Um, this, by the way, is the uh, tibial tuberosity. This bump right here where the patellar ligament attaches with the quadriceps. And then you have these ligaments on the side of your knee joint. And one of them is the lateral collateral ligament, and the other is the medial collateral ligament. Your book refers to this as the tibial collateral ligament, and this one is the fibular. Oops, I'm not spelling it right. Uh, collateral ligament. Um, and so those are on the sides. Uh, you also have the cruciate ligaments and the popliteal ligament in the back. So this is showing in the anterior surface, right? Because this is your tibial tuberosity. And so this is anterior. And so the anterior cruciate ligament is going from the anterior to the posterior. And then the posterior cruciate ligament is going from the posterior to the anterior and they cross. That's where cruciate comes in, they cross. You also have the um, meniscus, right? So you have the medial meniscus, which is this. And then you have the lateral meniscus, which is this. Uh, then again, your collateral ligaments. So you have the fibular collateral ligament, which goes here from the epicondyle down to the head of the fibula and the tibial collateral ligament here. Um, important to understand the knee, right? Because a lot of people, what happens is uh, when they have a knee injury, uh, depending on the type, they can actually uh, tear their anterior cruciate ligament they can um, tear their medial meniscus, right? So this is medial meniscus here, uh, and their medial collateral or tibial collateral ligament. So all three, and I'll, I'll show you why. Um, this lateral collateral ligament here is really not attached to the joint. It's all on its own. But the medial collateral ligament here is attached to the medial meniscus, which is also kind of attached here to the anterior cruciate ligament. So this is the ACL is attached to the medial meniscus, and that's attached to the medial collateral ligament. And so if one goes, they kind of all go. So what happens is if you have a force pushing your knee this way, it's pushing this this way, it's pushing this this way, and it's pulling the uh, medial collateral ligament all going that way. So medial collateral ligament's going to be stressed because forces are pushing that way, and that's going to pull the meniscus with it and that meniscus is pulling the ACL with it. And so all three of those structures will go. That's different if you, than if your foot stops, but this keeps going. Then you could just tear your ACL and maybe your, your medial meniscus. So just depending on which way the knee um, is affected, you can involve the uh, anterior cruciate ligament, the medial meniscus, and the medial collateral ligament, or just some like just the anterior cruciate ligament. 
Um, ankle, again, tibiotalar, talar navicular, navicular cuneiform. These are all just joints named after the two bones. Uh, the ligaments, same thing, except for deltoid ligament. It's on the side, uh, kind of looks like a delta, but uh, you, they're just named for what they're attaching. Um, I'm not asking any specifics on the on the ankle joints, um, but I just have a picture there showing you. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis is in any kind of arthritis is where you have inflammation of the arthroses or articulations or joints and um, this can be due to uh, your articular cartilage wears out and that causes damage or you have some kind of injury which causes damage or uh, rheumatism um, can be autoimmune um, but affects your joints so there are a number of things all right, so that concludes chapter eight, and I'll see you in chapter nine.